been here, but I'm glad to be back. <laughs> yes, sir. Like I said, we as men, sometimes we just have to do the thing we have to do to take care of our families. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I'm glad that I go to a church where you're not judged by Amen. your attendance. Yeah. But it's in your heart. Yeah. Yes, Lord. That's what I, I learned. I've learned that. And I learned to lean on the Lord and not man. Yeah. Because man will let you down every time. Like I said, I didn't come to preach this morning, but I believe I got one in me. <laughs> and like I said, I'm not going to uh, hold you long. But like I said, I want to introduce, that's why I say introduce, because it's been a while since I've been here. <laughs> I want to introduce a lady that is capable of putting the word down like it is, uncut. Yeah. uncut. She's a teacher. Man. I mean, she's an administrator. <laughs> Yes, sir. She, administer, she, I, she is administrator. Yes, sir. And like I said, she know that word. And like I say, I'm going to introduce to you some and present to others our first lady, Lady Deborah Blake. Yeah. <laughs> That's my guy right there. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Praise everybody. Amen. Praise God. I don't know. I didn't I try to figure out that Santa Claus. I see you in your red and white and you're, you're okay. Okay. I see what you got going there. I see it there, but we praise God for his goodness. Amen. 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 God has been good to me. And I tell you, the song said, I was just going back over my mind with no money in my pocket. He's still good. Amen. You know, when you're going through your troubles, he's still good. Amen. He put food on the table. He's still good. Shoes on your feet. Now, if you think you did all of that, I want you to know you're sadly mistaken. You're sadly mistaken. He made the way for you to do that. And he is so good. He's so good. Praise God for his goodness. Thank God for each one of you. And I just trust that each one of you had an extremely uh, happy and exhilarating uh, Christmas and that we are gearing up for 2016. Isn't God good? Yeah. Amen. God is good. I have a theme for 2016. I want to share it with you right now. My theme for 2016 is live in the moment. Yeah. Live in the moment. Live in the moment. You know, I'm going to put my cell phone down for a little while, and I'm going to start living in the moment. You know, we get so caught up trying to uh, snap pictures and everything. You're snapping pictures, and you're not enjoying the people that you're snapping the pictures of. So I, I just vow to put mine down for a little while. My children kind of get on to me because I leave it every now and then. Mama, what you got a cell phone for if you won't take it with you? Oh, I'm not connected to the cell phone. Amen. And so I want you to live in the moment. I want to enjoy you all while you're here, because when you're gone, it's too late. Amen? Amen. 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 We're in the study of Exodus, study of Exodus. And uh, let me see if this is working today. It is, I believe. Yes, it is. And so we have come to uh, this critical point. For the children of Israel, we have come to this point where now they're at uh, the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, and God gave that to Moses as a sign that said, don't think now, I, I called you. And as a sign that I called you, when I bring you out of Egypt, you're going to worship God on this mountain. This mountain is Mount Horeb. This mountain is Mount Sinai. And so at this mountain is where Moses is going to go up to commune with the Lord. When he comes back down, he's going to have what we know as the commandments, what we know as the law. So it is at this juncture in the history of the children of Israel that we began to talk about the law. Now, last Sunday, as we were looking at the law, what we said last Sunday as we were ending this is that the law, the law was never given as a way of salvation. Not as many people would have you to think that your salvation depends on the law, your salvation depends on what you do, but we know from reading the book of Galatians that uh, by the works of the flesh, by the works of the law, shall no flesh be justified. We know that uh, your salvation is not a reward, not a reward for good works. Why is that? Because your salvation was given to you. 
Salvation was given to you. It is a gift through faith in who? In Jesus Christ. But now what the law does, the law does is reveals God's righteousness. The law reveals God's righteousness and the law demands righteousness. But the law can't give righteousness. That can only come through Jesus Christ. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, and the 25th verse, 21st verse. So we're going to kind of uh, tie it up and move on this morning. Go to 2 Corinthians. All right, and we know this scripture. We know this scripture by heart totally. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. And in my Bible, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for who? For us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So as we were talking last, uh, uh, turn back to Exodus, turn back to Exodus. As we were talking last Sunday, what we were saying is that then the law is like a mirror, Jayla. When you go to the mirror, you begin to look in the mirror. And, and, and even, I'm going to say, even looking in the mirror, you can't see everything because this morning I had, had, had something on my dress and I thought I was cute. I t Ashley said, no, you got something right there. I was like, oh, okay, my husband didn't even look. You know, and the reason he didn't look because he's too busy trying to look at himself, trying to get ready to come. <laughs> so, you know, the mirror can show you, the mirror can show you that you're dirty, but you don't wash yourself with the mirror. Uh -uh, it takes a cleansing blood, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. So let's go back to Exodus and uh, let's begin our trek this morning. And so as we pick up this morning, what we say this morning then is that God doesn't give his spirit to us because we obey the law, but because we trust Christ. I want to read to you from uh, the Message Bible. Can I do that this morning? For just a little bit, and I want you to read to see what the Message Bible says. Uh, let me, I have to find it. And I want you to know that anytime you have a comment or, or uh, something you want to, to say, elaborate on, you just feel free to do so. From the uh, Message Bible, and I'm going to read uh, from Galatians, the third chapter. I'm going to read verses 2 through 4. And you can read, as, as I read, you can read in your version. Does anyone, have, does anyone ever read the message uh, version, message version? This is what it says. Let me put this question to you. This is Paul. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? Mm -hmm. But only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. <laughs> if you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through the whole painful learning process for nothing? It is not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. That makes it plain, doesn't it? Then it just make it plain. It's like you just like you just like you on a treadmill of futility. If you think that what you do can buy God's favor. If you think that what you do can buy your salvation. Because maybe what you do is not enough. If I give 100, is your 10 going to be enough? Or are you going to come up to me if, you know, you know, so it's never enough. You're just on a treadmill of futility when you're talking about salvation by works and salvation by grace. 
Okay, so let's go back to Exodus. And so it says, um, he gives us his spirit because we trust Christ. He doesn't give us his spirit, uh, nor does he give us our inheritance through the law. So what is the one thing that dead sinners need? The one thing that dead sinners need? Grace, grace, grace. But if you're dead, what do you need most of all? You need life. <laughs> if you're dead, the one thing you need most of all is life because a dead man cannot do anything. A dead man is lifeless. All right? So go to Ephesians, the second chapter. I said go back to Exodus, but I'm pulling a Pastor Bland on you this morning. Go to Ephesians, the second chapter. <laughs> Ephesians, the second chapter, and I'm gonna, I have to find it. Ephesians 2, and let's look at verses 1 through uh, 3. I'm coming, y'all. Okay, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, and you have he quickened, 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 quickened means to be made alive. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know, a lot of people will say, uh, I was sin sick. I was sin sick. But you were more than sin sick. You were absolutely dead. You were absolutely dead. And so he says, you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked how according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. Everybody said we're all the same. We're all the same, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by natures the children of wrath, even as others. So uh, the one thing that a dead sinner needs is life, but can the law give life? Mm. The law cannot give life. Let's go back to Galatians. Let's go back to Galatians. And let's look at Galatians 3 and 21. Galatians 3 and 21, are you there? Galatians 3 and 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the law can't give life. The law can't. We keep going to the law, looking for life in the law. But it's administration of death for us. And it is that way because how many of us can keep the law? None of us. None of us. But now, and, and we're doing this because this is what's happening at Mount Sinai. This is what's happening at Mount Sinai. They're getting ready to get a whole lot of laws and a whole lot of judgments and a whole lot of rules and a, a whole lot of uh, regulations. And, and when Moses came down, as we're going to see in a little bit, when Moses came down to say, now this is the book of the covenant, are you willing to keep it? What are they going to say? All that's written, we will do. Okay, hold on, Pastor. Okay, say it again. Second Corinthians, the third chapter. Second Corinthians, the third chapter. Second Corinthians, the third chapter. Six and the seventh verse. The 
5, it says, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, yeah. but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, mm -hmm. but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, was glory, so that the children of Israel could not step back to behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. So he, he calls it the ministration of death. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for that. Okay, you all, so if the law can give life, what is its purpose? What is its purpose? What is its purpose? That, that's kind of rhetorical because I have the answer here. The law is God's way of showing us our sins. Stripping us of what? Self-righteousness. So that instead of you crying out to yourself, how many of you have ever, when you need to help, cried out to yourself? Oh, help me, Deborah. <laughs> help me, Deborah. Because, oh, I would be messed up if I had to depend on myself. You know, no wonder the Bible says that six things they sell that the Lord hates. Mm -hmm. He hates even a proud look. Because pride will keep you from uh, your deliverance. Because in church, we're even uh, encouraged <laughs> what? Uh, what? Uh, uh, my mom said I always was a curse to me and my brother. Uh, got a lot of whipping. A lot of whipping. I hear him say it and I just learned it and could say it too. You know, but uh, getting to coming on up and in my teens and stuff, I dare, I wouldn't dare say nothing or do nothing around that. If I knew she was a mother, uh, the preacher, you know, you would always shine from being, don't let so and so see you. Here come Reverend so and so, or here come Mother so and so, or you gonna get it together then and everything. Just to learn as I got older, you got to Mother was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, how many of you have that experience? Did you all have that experience too? Uh, and I know, you know, and, and we're, and we're going to move on, but even, you know, I wouldn't be allowed to be standing where I'm standing today because now I, I really did think that there was something to the pulpit. No, they wouldn't let children. They wouldn't let children. It was kind of like uh, uh, when, when God. It was kind of like when God told the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, "Don't come near this mountain. Don't touch It's like don't come up here. Don't come up here." So I, I totally get what you're saying, and so. And like I think a lot of that comes from. No, I gave it to you, and you gave it back. Uh huh. A lot of that comes from um, not understanding how to rightly divide the words, you know, mm -hmm. because they did have that stuff. In the Old Testament, they had certain clothes you wear, certain places you couldn't go. They had uh, different rituals. They had uh, just different ceremonies. Right. But the thing about it was, all of that was pointing toward Christ. Mm -hmm. It was just a shadow of Christ. You show bread, you know, and, you know, don't. The Pharisees got mad at Jesus because Jesus, uh, men were going through the field on mm -hmm. Sunday. They took the corn, rubbed the corn. The mm -hmm. Pharisees said, how are you going to do this right here? You can't do this on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, well, don't you remember David when right. he was with his men right. and he was on the run? And they uh, ate the showbread, which was only allowed for the mm -hmm. priest. In other words, he said, he said the, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was the completion of everything. Mm -hmm. And so... But what happens in Lake Deborah is, is that they still got us in church All right. worshiping the shadows. Uh -huh. We don't have to do the shadows. One more example. Where uh, the 
Pharisees got mad at Jesus because they said, John's disciples fast all the time. Mm -hmm. But your disciples, y'all just eat. You don't pay no fast. He said, how can they fast when, when the bride, when the groom is with them? He said, now there's going to come a time mm -hmm. when I'm taking away. Right. Then they, 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 they can, you know, fast then. Mm -hmm. And so with Jesus being with us, and they, you know, they had us, the church I came from, they had us doing all the Old Testament stuff. I know. We had certain fast days on you know, Tuesdays and Fridays. You were fasting for the Lord. You were trying to get something that had already been given Take to you. Time, the yeah. news has never, it's just like the slaves that was on the plantation, and the, that way the independence had been signed, but the news never got to them. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know, you don't, you don't, know. Know. You don't get the benefits of it. Right. Right. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Yeah. And so it strips us of our self-righteousness so that we come to a point where we cry out for the grace and the mercy of God. Amen. Where you come to a point of realization, it's not a me, but it's you. And it's not what I can do. It's about all that you can do. It's about, it's about all that you have done. Right. It's about all that you have done. And so one of the main ministries of the Lord's pastor has already alluded to is that it was to prepare the way for the birth of Christ. Okay, so I'm going to read to you again from the Message Bible, and I'm going to read from Galatians. You can go there from Galatians, the fourth chapter this time. I'm going to read from Galatians, the fourth chapter, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. And, and remember again, mine is from the Message uh, Bible, the Message Translation of the Bible. Are you there? Mm -hmm. Says, so let me show you the implications of this, the implication of this. Uh, b remember before in Galatians 3, he asked them a question. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath to be with you? Because you began in the spirit, and now you're trying to be made perfect in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to, to, to look at now your own efforts. And so he says, to sum it up all, let me just show you the implication of how really foolish that was. But let me tell you, show you the implications of this. As long as the heir is a minor, mm -hmm. he has no advantage over the slave. Though legally, he owns the entire inheritance. He is subject to tutors and administrators until whatever date the father has set for emancipation. That is the way it is with us. When we were minors, we were just like slaves, mm -hmm. ordered around by simple instructions. Simple instructions, the law, do this, do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. Don't go over here, don't go over there. Wear this, wear that. Don't say this, don't say that. Don't come up here, stay back there. You were ordered around by simple instructions and those instructions, the law, that was the tutor, that was the administrator. He says, with no say in the conduct of our own lives with no say in the conduct of our own lives. But when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, mm -hmm. God sent his son, born among us of a woman, born under the conditions of the law, so that he might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Thank you, Lord. Thus we have been set free. Everybody say, I'm free to experience our rightful heritage. You, you can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children because God sent the spirit of his son into our lives crying out, Papa, yes. Father. Thank you, Lord. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, right. but a child? Yes. And if you are a child, you're also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. Thank you, Lord. Everybody give the Lord a hand praise for the word of God. Amen. Amen. The Lord a hand praise. And so it was to bring us, the law to bring us, to bring us, to show us that we couldn't do it, and to bring us into a, uh, the knowledge of him who could. Lady Deborah, why is it that it seemed like our leaders are the last one to get this? Is it because they get a vested interest in keeping this system going? Because the church is a system of fear. If you don't do this and you don't do that, then you're going to hell. Right. If, if you don't do like I said, and then we'll disfellowship you, we won't have nothing to do with you. 
uh, we'll whisper, we'll talk to the other members. And I, I experienced that when I left the church. I've been going to church with these folks for 25 years, Tyrone. Ain't never done nothing wrong. I mean, nothing to them, you know, just, I mean, blessed them, gave them money, fed them, did all that. And because God told me to start a church somewhere else, they had nothing else to do with me. Don't have nothing to do with me to the day. I'm just as happy as I can be. So I'm going to tell you, it's something when you find out that you don't need somebody. That's a freedom in itself. You find out you're crying about nothing. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, so then when we began to look at the children of Israel, as we just read in Galatians, the fourth chapter, the nation of Israel was like an immature child who needed a guardian. You needed, you know, at some point you need a guardian to care for you, to instruct you, to protect you, to show you the way. Um, but when children mature, the guardian is no longer needed. When children mature, the guardian is no longer needed. So go with me now to Exodus, the 20th chapter. Exodus, the 20th chapter. So we come to a point here. In Exodus, the 20th chapter, where um, this section of Exodus actually sections 20 or, or chapters 20 through 24 where it is dealing with basic laws included in that is uh, what we commonly refer to as the Ten Commandments the Decalogue and, and, and what we have come to know then from our reading is that the Ten Commandments uh, everything is centered the book of the covenant because there's a lot included in the book of the covenant that everything is centered, it hinges on those Ten Commandments. Everything springs from those Ten Commandments, the laws about how to treat your neighbor, the laws about what not to do, don't steal from your neighbor, don't covet all of that. All of the, all of the other things spring forth from the basic tenets of the Ten Commandments. And so remember now, we're talking about Israel, and we're talking about Israel's success. And remember, Israel's success as a nation depended first on them hearing the word of God, mm -hmm. believing the word of God, mm -hmm. and now obeying the word of God, obeying the word of God, obeying the laws that are set forth. And so, in Exodus 24, in Exodus 24, uh, verses 3 through 8, Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8, it says, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the law and all the judgment, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will do. And so... Uh, uh, Moses wrote all the words of the law and rose up early in the morning and built an altar unto the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and they said all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Concerning all these words. Okay, so during the time that he was there, chapters uh, 20 through 24, during the times that he was there, we understand, we know, because we read it in the Bible, we're not assuming this, he received, received uh, various laws about um, observation of the feast. Mm -hmm. He received not only uh, those laws, but he received the, the specifications on the construction of the tabernacle. All right and also about the establishment of the Aaronic uh, priesthood. So we're gonna go on over. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, probably come back to a couple of things in those chapters because some of that topic manner is spread throughout. So we'll come back to that. But what I want you to do now is go to chapter 32. 
Because this is not, the information in here is not topical. It's not like one thing happens right after another. You have to go back and you have to kind of put it together. And if you, you know, if you kind of read it like that, you'll get confused about that. So let's go over to uh, chapter 32. Because now Moses is up on Mount Sinai and having a good time. All right. Moses went up to Mount Sinai, you know, he went, he took, uh, he took uh, 70 of the elders, he took, uh, Aaron them only could go so far, and, and, and told them even when he was going up there uh, in um, uh, Exodus 24, uh, he said, now I'm going on up a little higher, so when I go, I'm leaving Aaron in charge. We'll see that. Well, uh, we'll see about that in chapter 32. Mm -hmm. And when I go on up a little higher, I'm going to leave Aaron in charge. And if you need anything, if there's anything that comes up among the people, then you all go to Aaron. Mm -hmm. So now Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He's up, and he, he and God they're just communing, and God is sharing with him and talking to him, and and Moses is you know, getting all that God says to him, but uh, his delight was interrupted by deep disappointment. Amen. By deep disappointment. So we're in Exodus, the 32nd chapter. Let me get there. Exodus 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up! Oh, Oh, what you sitting around here for? Get up. Make us gods. Make us gods which will go before us. For as for this Moses, now you see how y'all do. You see how y'all do? You would happen when he came and when he delivered you. But now you're acting like you don't even know him. Well, people do you like that. As for this Moses. And you know, you know how we will, you know, black folks, but well, this Negro, I don't know where he is. I don't know what he doing. He gone up there. We don't know when he coming back. He may not come back. And so, you know, we'll do it, won't we? Yeah. And so, that, that, that's, but this Moses, the man, like, you know, Moses, come on, y'all. The man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said, Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wife. Didn't hesitate. Now this is the one he, Moses left in charge. You better be careful about who you All leave right. in charge. Yes. And then, you know, sometimes you wonder, as you know, you leave people in charge sometimes, Madeline. I see you, Pastor. I see you, Pastor. So you leave people in charge, and sometimes, you know, you, get, you go down the list. Stephanie, okay, this is what I want you to do. First, I want you to do this. First, I want you to, sometimes you have to do people like that. Sometimes you have to do people like that. People say, well, you don't trust us enough to do it now. I don't, I do not. And so uh, he left Aaron there, and Aaron just said, okay, break off your earring. Okay, Pastor, I see you. Only, only thing I would say is, is that these are the same folk yeah, come that on said, whatever, you, whatever the whatever Lord said. Whatever the Lord said, yeah. we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And and so really, really, you're better off just just being being honest and telling the Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. If you don't help me, ain't no telling what I might do. You know. And so, as, as Pastor is saying, and so the Lord knew it wasn't in their hearts to keep the, their promises. And so the tragedy of the of this golden calf, because that's what he did with all of the earrings that they broke off. Then he fashioned a golden calf. Now, uh, in Exodus 32 and 30, 32 and 30, Moses says this. He says, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin. You have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Now, we know that every sin is a sin. You know, it doesn't, it's not a little sin. It's not a big sin. But this is why Moses said it was a great sin. For them, it was because of who had committed it. Now, God had told them when he brought them out, and when he brought them to Mount Sinai, I want you to be my special people. Mm -hmm. 
I want you to be my special people. You're going to be a, a royal priesthood. You're going to be a holy nation. This is what I want for you. You're my special people. Moses said it was a great sin because of when and where they committed it at Mount Sinai because they saw how God moved and they Amen. saw how God worked at Mount Sinai. He said it was a great sin because of what they had already experienced. They had seen the power of God. They had seen the mercies of God, how he judged Egypt when they were delivered. They, how, they saw how he opened up the Red Sea how they walked across on dry land. They saw how when they cried out for food, they had none, God delivered. God sent manna from heaven and he sent quail so that they would have meat to eat. A great sin for them because you have witnessed all of this and still you want God to be made. You want God to be made something that you can see something that you can feel proud about. Because when he presented them the calf, this is the God. This is the God that brought us up out of Egypt. And so why, why did they commit such an act in their time of history, in this, this time? Because this is an important time. It's because they were impatient. They were impatient with Moses, and we're coming to a point where you get to participate in today's uh, lesson. They were impatient, and when you are impatient, hear me now, everybody. When you are impatient, it's often the cause of impulsive actions that are sinful and regretful. And Pastor, let me do this because this may be getting ready to cut it because I want you to discuss this, okay? I want you to have a discussion. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Pastor. Okay. This is what I want you to do. Okay, go ahead, Pastor. I, I was going to say that my thing is I don't want God to make a way. Okay. You know, and that's what grace is. Grace is when God makes a way. The law is, is when I do, Tyrone, what I need to do in order for the way to be made. And as a man, as a human being, I'm not made up like that. I don't, you know, I want to do it so I can be proud of it. Okay. You know, and, you know, I don't have any problem with God helping other folks, weak people, people that are not smart enough or people that don't know how to do but as for me, you know, if you see me in a bath, help the bath. I'm all right. I don't need nobody. And, and it hurt me. It hurt me to be weak. It hurt me to be, Lord, what won't I do to keep from being embarrassed? What, what won't I do to keep from being embarrassed? I do a doubt. I walk around four or five blocks just to keep from being embarrassed. Pride is something else. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's the only thing that, that's... Uh, the only thing that keeps me from the blessings of the Lord is my pride. The moment that my pride come down, it's just like it's a downpour. The Lord is just all over me. But how long does it take me before I finally break down and say, Lord, I can't do it. You help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. Praise the Lord. I think I sat up in the office about two or three months. and Nobody coming. I ain't make a dime. I'm just saying, Lord, it's going to be all right. I don't need it. Living by faith. After about three months. I was sitting at that desk. I just, wasn't well, nobody in there but me. I said, Lord, I need some money. <laughs> I didn't get no help till I asked for it. I promise you I did. I didn't get no help till I asked. Praise the Lord, everybody. Okay, so this is what I want you to do. I want you to break up into four groups. I see my groups right here. They stop at this row. This group one stops at the row that uh, the Statons and the Hoskins are sitting on. That's one group. Uh, so group two starts with uh, Jalisa and uh, back to the back. That's uh, another group. Okay, this group right here stops at Tara's row. The group three stops at Tara's row. And group four starts at uh, Ashley's uh, row. All right? I want you to discuss this. Uh, is impatience a result of being undisciplined? What can be done to combat impatience? Okay, so you have to get up and move. If you're in a group, get up and move. Don't expect for the people to come to you. Y'all get up and, and form the group. 